to uh, and I'm I'm sure I missed a few uh, a few greetings, um, uh, but I wanted to. Uh, um, um, again, show that we're all being inclusive. And, and one of the things I learned doing, during this work was, um, um, you know, wherever possible, try to speak in someone else's uh, language and learn a little bit more about them because language is important to, uh, to communicate. The, um, my, uh, my Blackfoot name is Magusta Pinacum, um, meaning red morning. And it's a pleasure being here today. Um, um, this is um, uh, this event. Uh, it's been going as long as I've known uh, Alberta Civil Liberties. Uh, I'm sure, Linda, it's probably 20, 25 years now, I, I would assume. Um, and it's always a pleasure to attend and, 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 and represent the commission uh, that, I, that I'm a part of right now. So the... Um, uh, and the Human Rights Commission, as everyone knows, is um, it's got a it's got a limited, even though it's got the word human rights in it, it's got a limited scope that deals with uh, discrimination law, and most of the discrimination has to do with discrimination, uh, primarily in labor or services or in accommodations. Um, but um, what we've learned over these last uh, couple of years, uh, and and a lot of us doing this work knew it before that, is that um, Inequalities um, are not just in the area of discrimination um, and that they've really shown themselves in this time of COVID. They've shown themselves as, as, uh, as those that are marginalized and invulnerable, um, how, how, how things like, like climate change, like um, disease um, and, and this COVID uh, that's affected us all, like workplaces, like labor, um, um, how the inequalities have, have exasperated and, and, and have affected those that least can afford um, uh, it. And so this, this theme this year is uh, equality, reducing inequalities and advancing human rights. And I was really, I'm really looking forward to the to the speak the, the talks today because they are different. They are not on the traditional human rights. Uh, you know, this is human rights and this isn't um, in regards to you know labor and the things that human rights lawyers do. But they are dealing with those things that that um, that are um, that have shown the inequalities. Of, of our system and how, um, again, it's been exasperated by, uh, and people have been, that were vulnerable are actually more vulnerable and, are, and have been affected more, including women and girls, indigenous people, uh, people of color, uh, LGBT, uh, migrants, and people with disabilities. Um, and so, one of the things I've always said, and many organizations are doing this right now, is looking at things through a human rights lens, doing their work with it, and always keeping human rights at the forefront as they do it. Um, and, and to me, when I started getting into this work, um, I didn't realize that, that even though, again, when I look at our, our, the commission and our legislation, um, it is primacy legislation, human rights law, you know, that was put in, um, you know, uh, I think 35 years ago, 40 years ago with, with Premier Lougheed, um, they said this is important and we need to make sure that, that, um, that uh, human rights uh, abuses um, are, are addressed number one, because if we have inequalities, um, it affects us all. We're only as strong as our weakest link. And the more marginalized people we have, the more street people, the more people that are that are underhoused, the more people that that are have food um, inequality. Those things are are um, uh, are going to affect us all in our, our own uh, standard of life. Uh, but not only that, but our future and the future of our kids. As Linda was talking about her her son, and I've got five kids, nine grandkids. Um, you know, we need to protect them 
and their future and their communities in the future. So uh, again, it's a pleasure being here today. Uh, I'm looking forward to the talks and uh, I wish you all a happy uh, um, Human Rights Day on December 10th. Um, and uh, and uh, as we move forward in 2002, that uh, we'll all work towards reducing inequalities. All my relations. Thank you so much. And I, I, I don't know when is the right time to mention, but we both were well acquainted with somebody uh, who we should mention today, uh, who passed away recently, uh, <clears throat> Darren, Dr. Darren Lund. And I'm sure you know about that too. And it was such a shock to learn this is a person who was a friend of the research center and who was on AIM with us together. And um, I'm still processing. Um, and so we could just give him a moment of thought um, and hope that he's with us here in spirit because he used to come to our event. So um, yeah, I thought I should, when I saw your face, I thought, oh yeah, Darren. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, Cam. <clears throat> I guess we never know when it's going to be our time, so we have to make the most of the time we've got. So um, our next speaker is uh, Ayodeshi Otiti, who works at the Research Center, and he's going to introduce himself and his topic and um, hopefully get his PowerPoint going. Because I, I, There we go. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for your presence for this uh, August occasion uh, when we celebrate uh, the international human rights. Uh, <clears throat> the topic of my discourse is human rights and climate change, uh, investigating the, uh, the correlation between, uh, between them. So, uh, the outline of uh, the discourse uh, will be terminology, climate change and global warming, impact and consequences, human rights intersection with climate change, where I'll be asking what are human rights, which we all know, because I, I believe this is a, a human rights circle. Uh, also the question, the human rights have any correlation with climate change. And then uh, that will bring us to uh, the presence or the emergence of uh, inter human rights in the climate change, uh, starting with the Inuit uh, case uh, against the US, and also the Mali declaration of the Maldives that really brought to the world focus uh, the implication of climate change uh, on the human rights. And finally, uh, we briefly speak uh, concerning COP26, the uh, conference of the party, which just ended in uh, Glasgow, uh, Scotland, uh, about a week or so ago. Um, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, climate change, global warming, and related uh, terminology. Uh, climate change is defined as any significant change uh, or measure of climate change lasting for an extended period of time. So when we talk about changes, we are talking about temperature, precipitation, and uh, the wind patterns, which normally last for several decades. So with respect to global warming, this is described <coughs> as the current and ongoing rise in global temperature caused by increased concentration of uh, greenhouse uh, gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous acid, water vapor, and others. Global warming has been identified as being responsible for the change in climate uh, patterns, albeit it's one of the aspects of the change which has thrown uh, the temperature into uh, a bad world. Uh, the picture here shows uh, what the overabundance of uh, the greenhouse gases 
uh, like uh, carbon dioxide is causing to the uh, Earth planet. So the greenhouse gases is eating up the climate, uh, the, uh, our planet, and that's why. And on, under it, we see that <clears throat> the pre conference uh, of the parties, 26 that met in Glasgow, uh, the result is that with respect to the commitment made at the Paris uh, um, conference in the 2015 slash 2016, uh, everyone of the conference uh, pledged that there will be at least 25% in reduction of emissions. But towards the meeting of the co-op, only 7.5% of the emissions have been reduced. And what this tells us is that we are adding to not 1.5 degree increase, but to 2.7 degrees in temperature. We can all imagine even as of now, what the situation is with uh, the heat, which I will be ta talking about uh, later than the discourse. Then, with um, among other terminologies, the carbon dioxide is naturally occurring in the atmosphere, and it is part of the nature to uh, <clears throat> find uh, a global temperature for itself. And the, uh, sorry, sorry, some, uh, I've got some, this call, come. as I was saying, uh, is um, a naturally occurring gas and it's a part of the nature way to regulate uh, the temperature. Because if there are no carbon dioxide, then they are, the world will be even colder than what we experience in the, about the Arctic and the Antarctic. And carbon dioxide is also used by uh, the plant for photosynthesis because that's the, the way they are able, with that chemical, they are able to uh, synthesize the food and uh, others. But the overabundance of it is what is really causing the, the problem. Then, <clears throat> um, fossil fuels, you know, part of, uh, as you said, that uh, carbon dioxide later which are kept in the plant and in the land do normally surface. And one of the way the surface later is the fossil fuel that uh, we use, uh, our gas, our coal, and uh, our natural gas. So these are product of the dead living things, mostly trees. And uh, later when they are broken down and compacted by geomorphological forces, over millions of years and the change into the form in which we currently know them, which is a uh, fossil fuel. So the gas that we use is part of the carbon dioxide that have been part of uh, living things of uh, millions of years ago. Then this brings us to greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gases are mostly natural, and what they do is they absorb and trap the uh, radiated heat from the sun. And as I said earlier on, without these uh, gases, the world will be so cold that the life cannot, not many life can, you know, can, can live uh, if there are not these gases. But the problem is the overabundance of, of them. So greenhouse gases include carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous acid, and uh, water vapor. So greenhouse effect is naturally occurring process and it regulates the nature, uh, eat, and other things to make the life worthy of living. So it can be described as the nature thermoregulating process or moderating process that makes the earth livable. So, then we have this term anthropogenic. Uh, it refers to the polluting effect of human activities. And it, this includes global warming since the root of its cause are traceable to the human fossil fuel burning activities. Uh, on this, we have climate change and global warming 
impact and consequence pictures. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, six pictures here or slide. <clears throat> Carbon dioxide uh, methane emitting dump, uh, severe drought uh, that can lead to farming or a prelude to farming. Then we have the roaring tornado. We have the hurricane about to uh, cover houses. Uh, th those are littoral. And then we have the flooding. And also we have flood fires. These are impact and consequences of uh, global warming or climate change, which you know uh, come directly from the uh, the unbalance of our temperature in the atmosphere, uh, the Earth atmosphere. So now talking about impact and consequences of uh, climate change, um, the climate change as we have it is, is indiscriminately felt across the world. No country is spared. Uh, rising global temperatures are led to catastrophic heat wave and killing 100 and cause other unspeakable human and economic losses. For example, um, from June 25 to 29, the British Columbia region uh, recorded the highest temperature ever in Canada. The ton of littering on Sunday, June 27, 2021, recorded 46.1 Celsius degree, and that translates to 122 degree Fahrenheit. This was used to partly explain the wildfire that ravaged the town and brought it to the ground. The resulting heat wave also uh, okay. was responsible for so many lives, hundreds of lives that were lost within the same period. Uh, the map here shows us uh, the position uh, of Luton, um, part of uh, Canada. I think it's on the east side, east of uh, Vancouver. <clears throat> so for that, the climate change and global warming are also responsible for the rising sea level due to melting of glaciers, releasing millions of liters of water into the oceans and seas, erratic precipitation, flooding, drought, ocean acidification. This is due to the rising temperature across the ocean. And this temperature change expels or bleaches the algae in the tissue of the coral and causing the coral to lose to lose its color and die. And we know the, the usefulness of a coral in the uh, system, the oceanic system, especially for the lives that live in there, the fish and others. Uh, uh, so uh, the way the, the, the bleaching has caused the coral to die. And once they die, those fishes and uh, other uh, living things inside the water are about to be affected. Erosion is also a part of uh, the impact and the consequences. Loss of biodiversity and habitat, severe violent weather event, food and water insecurity are generally global now. And the econo social upriver that we feel across the world, especially as we are feeling now, Speaking of erratic precipitation and flooding, many cities and communities have been de devastated by heavy precipitation, never before seen in the British uh, Columbia. History of natural resource, <coughs> history of natural disaster uh, now uh, came with the uh, problem we have or the flood induced uh, disaster we have in merit. Uh, British Columbia. It has been completely devastated. Uh, it's a city of about uh, 7,000 and all, uh, everyone has been evacuated there. The, the problem is still there. So also we have Abbotsford, which is also in British Columbia. This, <coughs> many of the inhabitants have been catastrophically affected, including the farms and the variety of livestock millions that are now dead 
uh, as we speak, there is a state of emergency in the British Columbia. And what everything points down to the climate change and the consequences. Uh, the picture we are seeing is uh, one of the bridges that have been almost, uh, almost overwhelmed or been taken under. Uh, this is uh, the turn of uh, merit. And also uh, the, this picture is shows uh, merit, the turn of merit, British Columbia under the flood uh, water. And the next picture shows us uh, the washout road in British, uh, British Columbia. So woman, <coughs> now this brings us to uh, the human rights intersection with climate change. So what are human rights? As we all know, human rights are those rights that, uh, hum that us as human beings can claim an entitled to by virtue of being human. They are inherent in us and they are not state granted. They are universal, inalienable, indivisible, and interdependent. And the rights include right to life, liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of faith, religion, freedom of movement. The civil and political rights uh, spectrum known as fundamental rights. And we also have other rights, such as right to food, housing, clothing, education, work and right to higher standard of living and physical and mental health. Uh, the, the picture here shows us the human rights uh, and the articles as uh, described graphically. Uh, we're talking about the universal Declaration of Human Rights and that was done at uh, Paris on December 10 of 1948. Uh, in particular is uh, uh, Article 25 that grants uh, rights to uh, health, food, clothing, and housing. So uh, the second one is uh, more, more graphic, but it's also uh, uh, tells us about those rights that are granted to, to us or that we declare as we as being those rights that we are entitled to uh, by the declaration uh, universal declarations of human rights. So the question <clears throat> it bring this brings the question do human rights have any correlation with climate change? Yeah, it can be argued that the emergence of uh, human rights, both conceptually and legally, as a discipline, precede that of uh, climate change. In that twice, one would have thought that climate change, being the latter arrival, should have been cognitive of or included the human right. Regrettably, that was not the case for a very long time. So indeed, human rights as a conceptual and legal discipline do not receive any recognition within the climate change global discourse until the year 2000. What, <clears throat> what could be responsible for this state of absence of recognition of human rights within the climate change? That's why the uh, obvious correlation. According to Professor John Noss of the London School of Economics and Political Science, he says that traditionally climate change, both conceptually and legally has not been known, to speak about human rights. To Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland <clears throat> and a renowned prospection for United Nations on Human Rights, she puts it this way, that the preoccupation or our preoccupation with the common imagery of climate change, polar bear and disappearing glaciers was responsible for people not linking climate change to human rights. On for Dr. Stephen Humphrey, also a research director, International Council in Human Rights, he declares that the realization <coughs> of the uh, broad internationally protected human rights, such as right to health and food, property, and right 
of association and livelihood and culture are affected, but we hardly see it. Furthermore, it is uh, Dr. Humphrey's position that the worst climate change are expected to fall or to be felt by the individual group whose right protection is already precarious. For example, it says that dramatic impact of climate change are expected to occur or have been experienced in the world's poorest country, where, the protect, where human rights protection is often weak for a variety of reasons. Additionally, the global population that enjoys strong protection of human rights is not left out of the climate change catastrophe. Impact with consequences and such population is no overall well equipped to prepare the catastrophic uh, repercussion of the climate change. A good recent example of this. So what we are saying here is that although those, con those poor countries are, uh, are going to be affected for sure. However, even those of us in, in uh, living in countries where human rights are protected cannot escape the effect or catastrophic uh, effect of uh, climate change or global warming. There are a recent example of the Canada catastrophic summer and flooding and flooding fall, the way I would call it, which culminated in the province of British Columbia setting a record uh, of uh, in the hands of a Canadian meteorological uh, history at uh, the turn of Lytton that I mentioned on Sunday 27, 2021, recording at uh, 46.1 uh, degrees Celsius. And also we see what is happening now, both in the British Columbia and as of uh, the last three days, uh, <clears throat> the Newfoundland and, uh, and the Nova Scotia, uh, they, are, they are also under a flood and people have been, have been made homeless a lot of things are happening and critical infrastructure have been destroyed. So what this is telling us is that that's why the fact that we have strong human rights uh, protection program of infrastructure for ourselves, we, are not, we, we, are, we cannot escape the impact or the consequences of uh, human rights. So yet on the issue of the coming of human rights into climate change discussed very late, the disciplinary path dependence is considered a culprit. According to Dr. Humphrey, climate change emerges within the discipline of metrology. It became entrenched in physical sciences and later migrated into social science, particularly economics. Hence, the human rights correlation hardly appear on the radar of climate change. In time, however, human rights discourse slowly permeated into the climate change via the United Nations Human Rights Council through the activities of so and social liberal actions of individuals and organizations pointing, and direct, pointing to the direct and obvious correlation of human rights to climate discourse. Dr. Humphrey posits that the mutual interest between the human rights and climate change can be explained by the consequences that we are now experiencing. So uh, this brings us to Inuit, uh, the Inuit uh, sued the USA for climate change <coughs> Uh, human rights as individual human rights violation. On December 7, 2005, Sheila Watt Cloche, an Enoch woman and on a chairperson of Inuit Circumpola Conference, representing 62 named others uh, over to the United States of America. And the Canada was also included in that. And the petition, against the USA 
before the Inter-American Commission on Women's Rights for violating any human rights arising from U.S. delinquency on climate change policy. These are petition arose from the alleged U.S. failure to curb the emissions that are causing and contributing to global warming. And this global warming led to climate change that obviously affects the innate ways of life, <clears throat> especially food, housing, and culture. Central to the claim of the innate human rights uh, violation is the fact that USA is considered as the world's largest uh, emitter of greenhouse gases. Hence, the argument that USA should bear the largest responsibility to reduce the emission, which the global warming uh, uh, has caused and it's disproportionate disproportionately affecting the Arctic region of the world. And this was confirmed by the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. Uh, the picture here show a bit of uh, the innate way of life. And as you can see, uh, easily, if the glaciers are melting, uh, all the social and cultural way of life uh, will, will disappear. So on the other side of uh, the picture is uh, the Arctic region uh, uh, comprising of the Inuit, uh, a bit of Canada and almost all part of uh, uh, Greenland. So the, although the petition did not gain any traction, it however uh, brought the global awareness more than ever before to the climate change and its impact and the obvious but missed connection to human rights. Then this, uh, this brings also between 2005 when the uh, Ms. Cloche brought uh, the petition, then we have the one right inside the uh, United Nations itself. Uh, in November of 2007, the representative of the small island uh, st independent state uh, of uh, Mali declared in Mali rather Maldives. Uh, Maldives is an, a tiny South Asian country in the middle of Pacific Ocean. So here, <clears throat> the, the representative signed a treaty with the declaration that linked climate change and human rights together among the declaration <clears throat> purpose was to shift the focus or the agendas of fight against the climate change from environmental impact to human rights impact of the climate change. The declaration made it clear that human rights to a reality environment is essential to all other basic and other human rights. The declaration spurred the United Nations Human Rights Commission to commission a study which later identified how climate change adversely affected full enjoyment of human rights, such as <clears throat> right to it and adequate standard of uh, living. Uh, this brings us to uh, the Conference of the Party 26 and Human Rights. The picture uh, we are seeing is our um, Honorable uh, Minister of uh, Environment and Climate Change, Honorable Stephen Gibble at uh, Glasgow, uh, representing Canada over the environment uh, meeting. Um, the COP and human rights, impact and consequences of climate change continue to adversely affect human rights enjoyment, both in quality, uh, both in quantity and quality. It has been said that climate change represents the greatest 21st century threat to our lives, livelihood, and ways of life. And um, this, <coughs> this, what we are experiencing, or what our, our fellow Canadians, 
are experiencing in the British Columbia is, our, is, a, is a clear demonstration of what a threat uh, the climate change is to us. The conference of the party 26 meet in the city of Glasgow, Scotland from November 1 to 13, 2021, it had come and gone, but it remained to be seen how far the final agreement of COP26 and the isolation, quantity and quality of enjoyment of human rights that are currently and continually suffer, suffering the impact of, and consequences of climate change goes. So the final agreement, as we see, that came up on the November 13, says it maintained the place to keep the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees centigrade. But as you are aware, before the coming, uh, before the attendance uh, of the uh, parties, uh, the realization was that only 2.7% of the 55% of reduction are being you know, realized. How the 1.5 uh, uh, Celsius is going to be maintained or be actualized, we are still to see that. But what the parties that the COP26 decide that it commits to reduction of carbon emission by 45% by 2030 uh, from, the from the 2010 level, and net zero by, 19, uh, by 2050. Additionally, the COP agreement commits to strengthening the adaptation and mitigation financing. It calls on the countries yet to chip in their contribution to do so by November 2022. Furthermore, developed wealthy countries and the financial institution are enjoined to accelerate the alignment of the financing activities with the objective of the Paris Agreement. Moreover, the agreement urges a halt on deforestation which effect has significantly contributed to the increase in carbon dioxide, particularly the massive deforestation currently impacting the Amazonia rainforest. It is encouraging that Brazil is among the signatories to this agreement in the final COP26 agreement. Yet, the agreement comes with so many minuses, which may not go well for the rights are the human rights. For example, both India and China made an 11th hour change to the final draft on the coal burning by changing face out to face down. This means that instead of those countries and others who are using coal to face out completely the burning of coal, what they are, they are allowed to do now is they gradually, they are going to gradually reduce the amount of coal, how much, nobody knows. Invariably, this means that the unmitigated continuation and adverse environmental and human rights impact and consequences will continue, especially with the coal burning, we come sulfur dioxide, which is clearly implicated in nitrogen drain and respiratory illnesses, particularly the soot this, that normally cause flow from fog and smog. So we experienced that uh, about uh, last week. Uh, anyone who travel between uh, Calgary to Camo and even inside Calgary, we see what uh, the fog uh, can do. Uh, <clears throat> then we, it's also caused uh, lung diseases such like asthma and cancer. And it's also affect uh, neurological, uh, it's also responsible for neurological ailment across uh, everywhere it is used. Also, the $1 billion climate change adaptation and mitigation fund agreed to and payable by the developed rich country since <clears throat> mostly developing country who suffer the worst impact or consequences of climate change are yet to be paid or are yet to be 
you know, gather together in order to, to disburse it to those countries that need them. The funds are to assist the worst impacted developing country and adapt and mitigate environmental human rights and social consequences of climate change. The pledge to contribute makes this fund available to the family country is currently almost three years behind the pledge actualization date because uh, the pledge was made at the Paris uh, conference of 2015. Hence, why many claims that COP26 outcome holds promise for human rights, the doubt remains. Climate change consequences to me, are consequences for human rights. Hence, there is an urgent need for all hands to be globally on, on deck to halt the runaway climate change. Uh, that will be the end of my discourse on the climate change. Thanks for listening. I welcome our questions and comments later. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Ayodeshi. Um, as you mentioned, we're, uh, I forgot to mention before, we're going to hold our questions to the end. Um, if you don't mind, if you really have a burning question, write it down so you don't forget. And uh, thank you very much. And just a, a gentle reminder to keep your mics off unless you're speaking. And I'm pleased to introduce uh, Rowan Hickey, uh, who works with us at the Research Center and who um, comes to us from Ireland, but she can maybe explain that a little bit better. <clears throat> sure thing, thank you, Linda. I'm just going to get my screen set up. Give me one moment. Right. All right, is my uh, screen visible for everyone? Yeah, I can see it. Perfect, great, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, uh, hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here today uh, at Alberta Civil Liberties Research Center uh, for our celebration of International Human Rights Day. Uh, as Linda mentioned, my name is Rowan Hickey, and I use the pronouns she and her. Uh, before we get started, I'll just share a little bit about myself. So before joining ACLRC this fall, I finished up my Master's of Law at the Irish Centre of Human Rights, where I studied international human rights law with a focus on the human rights impacts of fracking, as well as the human rights of trans children. So today uh, I'm excited to discuss with you a topic that I find incredibly interesting and which has seen some significant developments within the last few weeks and months and an area that I think will continue to grow and develop in international human rights law with hopefully a corresponding trickle down effect on the domestic level. So uh, today I will be taking a look at the international human right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. And I'll be taking you through some of the recent developments in this area. So as we saw in the last presentation, climate change poses a significant and ever growing risk to our planet. Uh, we are already seeing the impacts of climate change in our daily lives from the increasing number of and severity of abnormal weather events, droughts, floods, and heat waves to rising sea levels and the destruction of ecosystems around the world. This impact of climate change and environmental deterioration has been described as a human rights crisis by the international community, uh, as seen here in this quote from Michelle Bachelet, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. And this sentiment is not isolated, with various UN and regional human rights bodies and institutions really stressing the dire consequences that climate change has, as well as the destruction of our environment and its impact on human rights. So in international law, there have been multiple international agreements, treaties, and goals to act against climate change, and also that recognize the importance of the environment. Uh, you can see a selection of them listed here. 
Uh, through these agreements, states have agreed to work towards sustainable development goals, as well as lessening their environmental impact and the emission of fossil fuels. However, despite these agreements and the negative impact our changing climate and deteriorating environment has on people and their rights around the world, up until very recently, there has not been an explicit recognition of the human right to a clean and healthy environment in international human rights law. But thankfully that has changed. So on October 8th, 2021, the Human Rights Council of the United Nations recognized the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment as a human right in its historic resolution 4813. Now this resolution is a significant step forward in international human rights law, as it not only recognizes the right as a human right, but it also notes that the right is related to other rights and existing international law, and it affirms that the promotion of the human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment requires the implementation of those international environmental agreements that we mentioned. So the significance of this resolution is really also emphasized when examining the sheer number of people, agencies, and organizations who advocated for this right uh, over a course of many, many years, and whose work really contributed to the recognition of this right. Uh, in the resolution itself, the Human Rights Council notes this contribution, uh, citing the work of several United Nations entities, including the United Nations Environmental Program, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, and the World Health Organization, and many, many more. And it also notes uh, the contribution of more than 1,100 civil society, child, youth, and Indigenous peoples organization, as well as the significant leadership from the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Environment, as well as uh, the leadership from states such as the Maldives. Now, in discussing the importance of this right, the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, uh, pictured here on the slide, has really emphasized that the global recognition of this right would increase accountability and require that every country do their part to protect their people from the devastating impacts of pollution, toxic substances, climate change, and biodiversity loss. But before we examine further what this resolution, resolution rather, could do, uh, it is also first important to examine what exactly is contained within this human right. So in examining what the human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment entails, uh, I'd just like to show a short video from the Special Rapporteur, uh, as I, I think it does a really good job of just going over it. Here we go. The right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is one of the most important human rights of the 21st century. Our home, this beautiful blue-green earth, is the only planet in the universe known to support life. Yet humans have created a global environmental crisis involving the climate emergency, collapsing biodiversity, pervasive pollution, and a surge in emerging infectious diseases of zoonotic origin like COVID-19. The right to a healthy environment includes clean air, safe and sufficient water, healthy and sustainably produced food, a safe climate, flourishing ecosystems and biodiversity, and toxic-free environments where people can safely live, work, study, and play. This right also includes a procedural toolkit, including access to information, participation in decision-making, and access to justice with effective remedies. Finally, the right to a healthy environment includes a guarantee of non-discrimination, so it can be enjoyed by everyone, everywhere. The time is now to recognize and implement this vital human right. So as we saw in the video, the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is really comp comprised of three main rights and corresponding obligations for states uh, to uphold. So this includes the uh, more physical elements and in rights, including the right to a safe climate, clean air, and clean water. 
uh, procedural rights, such as access to information, participation in decision making, and access to justice and effective remedies. And then also a guarantee of non-discrimination. So really ensuring that everyone can enjoy the full breadth of this right. So now that we've covered what this right entails, we must also ask why recognizing this right is so important. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Environment really emphasizes that the right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment has really already appeared in many constitutions and legislation in countries since the 1970s. Uh, today, 156 of the 193 UN member states recognize this right through constitutions, legislation, court decisions, and regional treaties. However, in spite of this wide recognition, recognition of its importance and uh, of its importance rather, the right to a healthy environment uh, had previously not been recognized as a human right and implemented as such. Having the right to a clean and healthy environment recognized as a human right on a, an international level by the UN Human Rights Council, which is the principal intergovernmental forum within the UN addressing human rights, is really a huge step forwards towards the advancement of this right. Although this Human Rights Council resolution is a significant step forward, it's also important to recognize that as a Human Rights Council resolution, it is not legally binding on states. However, although not legally binding, it does still hold significant power and sway. The Human Rights Council's function really is to ensure the effective implementation of human rights as, a gu as guaranteed by international law, and in particular by the various instruments of the United Nations. Unlike international human rights treaties bodies, however, the Human Rights Council really monitors uh, the respect for human rights by all members of the UN, not just the states who are party to those specific human rights treaties, uh, thus allowing for monitoring of human rights for even those UN member states who may not have agreed to uh, every human rights treaty. Being a Human Rights Council resolution will really allow for this resolution to apply to and influence all mem UN member states, as opposed to only uh, impacting those certain states uh, that may be members of uh, specific UN human rights treaties. This resolution also has the potential to have a much wider impact with the resolution including an invitation to the UN General Assembly to consider the matter of a human right to a clean and healthy environment. Uh, unlike a Human Rights uh, Council resolution, the count where the council is made up of 47 states, the UN General Assembly is made up of all 193 member states of the UN. Now, again, although the UN General Assembly resolutions are also non-binding, as they are voted on by all member states and uh, are passed by majority vote, they are often seen to hold a little bit more uh, political power and sway. So if the right, human right to a clean and healthy environment were passed by the UN General Assembly, uh, such resolution would gain significant traction in the international community uh, and work to influence more states to adhere to the principles and obligations contained in that right. So, uh, now, although we've just discussed the political sway this resolution holds and the potential impact it may have, one of the major sticking points and questions that comes up again and again in discussing human rights resolutions is that if the resolution is non-binding, why should states care about meeting the obligations under this right? So although the resolution recognizing this right is non-binding, this resolution really emphasizes and outlines the interconnected nature of the environment with other human rights. It is then in states' interests to ensure that in meeting their human rights obligations under human rights treaties, which are binding, that they are working towards providing a clean and healthy environment. Now, it should be no surprise that our environment impacts our human rights. After all, humans, the holders of human rights, live, work, and play in our environments. So when our environment is not healthy, our rights as humans will be impacted. The United Nations Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, fact sheet number 38, examines some of these connections, identifying which human rights are most affected by climate change. Among some of these rights most impacted by climate change and the environment include the right to life, health, water, food, and adequate housing. 
Now, these rights are contained in various human rights treaties and impose uh, binding obligations on states to uphold these rights and are also contained in uh, documents such as UN declarations and resolutions. So in looking at the right to life, uh, the right to life is one of the most widely recognized rights in international human rights law. This right protects against state action or inaction, which poses risk to the life of persons. States in meeting their obligations to ensure the right to life have both negative and positive duties where they must either refrain from harmful actions or take positive actions to pursue protecting the right to life. Now, in an environmental context, this could include taking steps to preserve the environment and protect it against harm and reduce pollution and climate change, which could be caused either by public or private actors. For the right to health, uh, this has been described as a fundamental human right, uh, indispensable for the exercise of other human rights. And pursuant to the right to health, everyone is entitled to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health conducive to living a life in dignity. The Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has described the right to health as an inclusive right in that it includes not only the right to access to health care, but also the right to the underlying determinants of health, such as access to safe and potable water and adequate sanitation, an adequate supply of food, nutrition and housing. And this brings us to the right to water. So water is essential for communities and ecosystems. It supports not only life system, life systems, but uh, also cultural and economic activities, and is accordingly essential for the enjoyment of other human rights. The right to water does not merely require access to water, but also access to clean water. States should then ensure that natural water resources are protected from contamination and are free from chemical substances and other uh, harmful components that could constitute a threat to a person's health. Uh, thus, states must ensure that pollution and other actions that impact the environment do not impact this right. In looking at the right to food, uh, the availability of food is fundamental to the right to life, health, and human dignity. Uh, ensuring the right to adequate food means that uh, food must not only be available and of sufficient quality, but it must also be free from adverse substances. So this, of course, refers to food safety and especially the prevention of contamination. And then finally, the right to adequate housing. Uh, so the right to adequate uh, living conditions and housing is an essential part of the right to an adequate standard of living. The special rapporteur on the right to adequate housing notes that climate change induced extreme weather, weather events pose uh, risk to the right to adequate housing in urban settlements, smaller settlements, and especially small islands. Uh, this special rapporteur has cautioned that the implement implications of climate change will be severe, uh, particularly for low income groups and those living in countries that lack the resources, infrastructure and capacity necessary to protect their populations. Now, in addition to impacting human rights, uh, climate change and environmental damage are widely recognizing, re recognized as disproportionately impacting uh, vulnerable groups and people. Uh, UN human rights bodies have recognized the disproportionate impact on marginalized and vulnerable, vulnerable persons that, due to discrimination and pre-existing inequalities, have limited access to decision-making or resources, uh, and this includes groups such as women, children, persons with disabilities, Indigenous peoples, and persons living in rural areas. And this disproportionate impact on marginalized groups really emphasizes the importance of the right to a clean and healthy environment's guarantee of non-discrimination, where states must ensure not only the physical and procedural elements of the right are protected and insured, but also that they are insured and enjoyed equally. So now that we understand why states will want to ensure the right to a clean and healthy environment is met, we must ask, how can states go about fulfilling this right? Under the resolution, the Human Rights Council reaffirms states' obligation to respect, protect, and promote human rights and reference the framework principles on human rights and the environment. Under these framework principles, uh, states' human rights obligations as they relate to the enjoyment of a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment are set out in 16 principles 
Uh, and other these under these principles, it addresses things such as how to ensure people have access to sufficient information, um, the types of remedies that might be required, and so on. Now, in addition to reaffirming the framework principles for human rights in the environment, uh, under provision four of the resolution, the Human Rights uh, Council encourages states to uh, build capacities for the uh, efforts to, produce, for to, to protect the environment in order to fulfill their human rights obligations and commitments, and to really enhance their cooperation with other states. Uh, to share good practices in fulfilling human rights obligations related to the enjoyment of a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, adopt policies for the enjoyment of the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, and to take into account human rights obligations and commitments related to the enjoyment of a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment in the implementation of and follow up to their sustainable development goals. Now, how states choose to implement these actions will undoubtedly vary state by state. However, there is hope that it will contribute to a meaningful change and improve the human rights of people across the world. So one of the ways that would best serve to advance the aims and obligations under this human right would be through the national recognition of and implementation of this right. As an international human right and as a human rights council, as opposed to a treaty right, Enforcing the implementation of this right uh, is more difficult for individuals if their countries have not adopted the right on a domestic level. Domestic implementation of this right could include incorporating the right uh, to a clean and healthy environment in its constitution, human rights code, or other legislation. The evidence really shows that recognizing the legal right to a healthy environment improves the lives of many people. Uh, decades of experience from countries that have recognized this right shows that it has led to stronger environmental laws and policies, improved enforcement of laws, greater public participation in environmental decision-making, increased access to justice, and fewer incidents of environmental injustice. Now, in looking to Canada, uh, Bill C-28, the Strengthening Environmental Protection for a Healthier Canada Act, was introduced earlier this year. Now, unfortunately, while the bill was in its second reading, uh, the bill essentially died on the order paper when Parliament was dissolved. However, with Parliament back in session, it is possible that this bill or maybe a similar bill may be reintroduced. Uh, and thus, I think it is worth discussing as it could be an important opportunity for the right to a clean and healthy environment to be implemented into uh, domestic Canadian law. So Bill C-28 would have updated Canada's Environmental Protection Act, with one of the changes uh, being the recognition that every individual in Canada has a right to a healthy environment and will require the government to protect that right. Uh, suggested amendments also included the recognition of the importance of considering vulnerable populations and the importance of Canadians having information regarding the risks of toxic substances. So this bill, or maybe a similar bill in the future, uh, would be a significant step forward for Canada in bringing the right to a clean environment into practice into our country and aligning with the international human right to a clean and healthy environment. So uh, to just quickly summarize what we've discussed today, uh, the recent Human Rights Council resolution recognizing the international uh, human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable, sustainable environment is a significant step forward. Uh, the right itself includes physical, procedural, and non-discrimination elements for right, rights holders and obligations for states. Uh, despite the resolution not being legally binding, its status as a uh, Human Rights Council resolution does carry significant political sway, uh, which may serve to influence states who have, not or, who have not already done so to implement this right into their own domestic law. And the right to a clean and healthy environment really intersects with and reinforces other human rights found in UN treaties and documents. And finally, that domestic recognition and implementation of this right is a very crucial um, step for its effective implementation. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you everyone for your attention. Uh, I hope you learned a little bit about this uh, ever-evolving area of international law, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of today's presentations. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Rowan. Um, I've taken lots of notes. <laughs> um, the next speaker is uh, Borsha Mene. She's talking about a little bit, uh, we're taking a little bit different angle, uh, important issue nevertheless, uh, on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, child marriage and international human rights issues. Hi everyone, thank you um, Linda for that. My name is Borsha Elizabeth Mene and today I'm going to be talking about uh, child marriage and international human rights law. Um, this topic isn't really new, but I decided to talk a little bit about this because of the current situation in Afghanistan where um, parents are giving their kids out in marriage just to get some money to survive. So I've been interested in this topic. So um, I've been interested in this topic right from like my childhood, uh, where I, I saw a movie set in North Nigeria where a young girl um, between the ages of 11 and 13, I'm not so sure I was about eight years old myself, was handed over to a gray bearded, bald headed man. And in my young mind at the time, I knew there was something wrong with that. This young girl got married to this man and she got pregnant almost right away. She um, had complications during the, 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 the birth process and the baby died and she eventually passed on. And, and that's one of the impacts of child, uh, child marriage globally. It's still a concern us up today. Now, um, what is child marriage? So back to sort of that, back to what I was saying. And another thing is um, non-compliance with the 2020 Sustainable Development Goals on reporting. Not all the member states have been doing these reports and because international law uh, is persuasive, there are not enough um, mechanisms in place to hold these state parties accountable. Another thing is cultural and religious conflict. So um, in, in a situation where um, parties argue that 18 years should be the minimum age for um, anyone to get married, any person to get married, there are some religious and um, cultural beliefs that people who are way younger can get married. Now, I don't want to go into the discourse about consummation. Some people, some re religions believe that people who are way younger can get married, but do not have to consummate the marriage until they get to a certain age. And some, some, some other uh, religions believe that children as young as 11 and 12 are, are, are mature enough to be able to handle the pressures and everything that comes with marriage. Another thing is ineffective safeguards to check if consent for marriage is truly free and informed. And like I mentioned earlier, in a situation whereby a parent or a guardian presents um, th themselves to the solemnizing authority to say, oh, consent has been obtained, but this person isn't present, that marriage can still go ahead. And that's a problem because definitely if the child or the intending um, parties to the marriage are underage and do not give their consent, they can still get, get married in, 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 uh, in, in their absence. Another growing concern, particularly in places like Canada that are de developed countries is common law relationships with persons under 16. Now, common law partners have certain legal rights. They don't, they don't have to get married, but they can have some benefits that come with being married. And where you have situations where persons who are below the age of 18 and do not even get parental consent, consent begin to live together, have babies, try to work, uh, they can also get all of the disadvantages that come with um, getting married early. Um, so 
just a brief history, I think I went a bit ahead of myself here. Um, before the Civil Marriage Act in Canada was amended in 2015, the legal marriage age in Canada was 14 years, but, but now the minimum age is 16 with the additional requirement of parental consent. And one would observe that 16 years is way below the international discourse that, that surrounds um, um, child marriage. Analysts and, and, and people and organizations who have tried to fight child marriage over the years keep talking about 18 years, but Canada is 16 with parental consent. And the fact that there might not be appropriate checks and balances to make sure that the, the consent was, the, the consent of the parents is genuine, that, that's a problem here in Canada. So I have just a few recommendations here um, to help eradicate child marriage. The first is effective legal and pol policy system, both at the international and state level to, to eradicate child marriage. So those state parties that are bound by the sustainable development goals of 2030 should do their part to do the reports. And the international, um, the UN and other international bodies should take this report seriously and try to enforce sanctions on states that are not, not compliant. Now, um, there should also be education to create increased awareness on child marriage. Um, in developing countries where um, majority of these parents who give their, their children out below the age of 18, um, some of them do not understand the impact of their decisions, and, and that's where awareness comes in because they just see it as a situation where, oh, this might just be a bond between both families. Um, family A and family B, bringing our children together is going to bond us. We're, we're going to be like brothers, but they do not understand that certain human rights will be impacted and that would be a problem for those getting married. Now, another solution would be to provide economic incentives to employ empower um, impoverished families who marry off their children for economic benefits, like, like what's going on in Afghanistan right now. Um, people are doing that. Most people are doing that because of the economic situation in the country. If things were better, if the war wasn't there, if they had enough to eat and they had enough money to take care of themselves, they wouldn't go into, they wouldn't give their children out in, in marriage uh, before the age of 16 or 18, as the case may be. Now, like I'm just going to conclude with this. It's just a food, food for thought in Canada. Um, so I asked myself when I was doing the research, why is it that in Canada, they're setting the, the minimum age for certain things, for certain, certain activities is 18, like buying alcohol, um, joining the army. What makes ch child marriage, what makes marriage so different? that there is an exception to the to to getting married at 18 why is it that um you you cannot even with parental consent you will still not be served if you go into a bar and you're below 18 even with parental consent you won't be given alcohol to drink but but why is it that with parental consent a person can get married below the age of 16 and that's everything for me and i hope that as time goes on, people will continue um, to talk about child marriage and it will be a theme of the past globally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Borsha. Uh, <clears throat> and in the interest of making sure she has sufficient time, we'll move on to Jocelyn Joanne Finneys, who's going to talk about trans children and human rights. And she's our article student. So she's my article student, I guess. <laughs> I own you. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Jocelyn Joanne Finez, or JJ for short. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and today I'm going to be giving a brief discussion on international human rights and trans youth or trans children. Uh, 
So this, sorry, so this presentation is a brief overview of some of the international human rights um, that transgendered youth, so children and adolescents have. Not all obstacles and barriers that trans youth face will be discussed and not all legal doctrines, instruments or principles will be considered. So first I'd like to talk about some terminology. Um, so I, I've listed a few terms that pop up in the research. And as I understand that the terms used in this presentation may not be wholly representative of those who may use different terms to define experiences, traits, or other attributes. The terms used are most found in the research consulted for this presentation. However, if there are any comments on the terms used or the definitions provided, please feel to contact me um, as I'd love to learn more um, about differing views. So I've labeled the terminology um, alphabetically, so not in any particular order other than alphabetically. So the first term is cross-sex hormone therapy. So cross-sex hormones are the hormones given to a transgender child, most commonly after they've undergone puberty suppressants. This is not a requirement, however. Sex hormones for transgender girls involves taking estrogen and for transgender boys, testosterone. Gender, as defined by the World Health Organization, refers to the characteristics of women, men, girls, and boys that are socially constructed. This includes norms, behaviors, and roles associated with being a woman, a man, a girl, or a boy, as well as relationships with each other. As a social construct, gender varies from society to, to, to society and can change over time. Gender interacts with, but is different from sex, which refers to the different biological and physiological characteristics of females and males and intersex persons, such as chromosomes, hormones, and reproductive organs. Gender and sex are related, but different from gender identity. Gender identity refers to a person's deeply felt internal and individual experience of gender, which may or may not correspond to a person's physiology or designated sex at birth. Gender affirmation surgery um, is defined by the Alberta Health Services website, which offers a definition as a procedure that changes the look and function of physical sex. Gender affirmation surgeries make your physical sex more closely match the gender you identify with. Surgeries include top surgery, so removing the breast tissue or performing a breast augmentation, or bottom surgery, which may be performed to remove the sex organs, such as testicles, a penis, uterus, and or the ovaries. Gender dysphoria is a psychological, is psychological distress that results from an incongruence between one's sex assigned at birth birth and one's gender identity. This will be in dis discussed in more detail on the next slide. Puberty suppressing hormones are also known as puberty blockers, inhibit the release of sex hormones to prevent puberty in adolescents and precocious puberty in children. Precocious puberty is the onset of puberty in children too early. So between the ages of about seven and nine years old. The most common puberty suppressant is gonadotropin releasing hormone. GNRHs have been used for decades to treat gender dysphoria, which will be discussed later, um, although puberty suppressing is not their original purpose. And the definition of transgender from the Oxford Dictionary is, um, is denoting or relating to a person whose sense of personal identity and gender does not correspond with their birth sex. For the purpose of this presentation, I'd like it to be known that two-spirit, non-binary, gender non-conforming, and gender fluid, gender fluid identities are not discussed, nor is the term transgender meant to expressly include or exclude these additional identity communities. So some of the concerns and obstacles, um, like I said, I will not be covering all of them. So the two that I've chose to focus on today are the pathologization of children and gender dysphoria, as well as gender affirmation, um, the social, legal, and medical barriers. 
So pathologization is a barrier some trans youth face in their transition journey. Many healthcare professionals require a diagnosis of gender dysphoria in order to prescribe puberty suppressants in youth for cross-sex hormones in older adolescents and to perform gender affirmation surgery. The DSM-5 defines the gender dysphoria in adolescents and adults as a marked incongruence between one's experienced or expressed gender and their assigned gender, lasting at least six months as manifested by at least two of the following criteria. A marked incongruence between one's experienced or expressed gender and primary or secondary sex characteristics, or in young adolescents, the anticipated secondary sex characteristics, a strong desire to be rid of one's primary and or secondary sex characteristics because of a marked incongruence with one's experienced or expressed gender, or in young adolescents, a desire to prevent the development of the anticipated sec secondary sex characteristics. A strong desire for the primary and or secondary sex characteristics of the other gender. A strong desire to be of the other gender or some alternate agen gender different from one's assigned gender at birth. A strong desire to be treated as the other gender or some alternate gender different from one's assigned gender. A strong conviction that one has the typical feelings and reactions of the other gender or some alternative gender. In order to meet the criteria for this diagnosis, the condition must also be associated with clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, and other important areas of functioning. The DSM-5 defines gender dysphoria in children, similarly um, as a marked incongruence between one's experienced or expressed gender and assigned gender lasting at least six months, but must must show uh, um, as manifested by at least six of the following criteria. A strong desire to be of the other gender or an insistence that one is the other gender or some alternative gender different from one's assigned gender. In boys who are assigned gender boy, a strong preference for cross-dressing or simulating female attire or in gender assigned girls, a strong preference for wearing only typically masculine clothing and a strong resistance to the wearing of typically feminine clothing. The criterion that a strong preference for cross-gender roles in make-believe in play or fantasy play, a strong preference for toys, games, or activities stereotypically used or engaged in by the other gender, a strong preference for playmates of the other gender. In gender assigned boys, a strong rejection of typically masculine toys, games, and activities, and a strong avoidance of rough and tumble play. Or in gender assigned girls, a strong rejection of typically feminine toys, games, and activities. Further criterion include a, cri a strong dislike of one's sexual anatomy, and a strong desire for the physical sex characteristics that match one's experienced gender. As with the diagnostic criteria for adolescents and adults, the condition must also be associated with clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. Labing, labeling a child who is transgender as disordered, like in the DSM-5, has wider implications. Trans youth face higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation over their cis peers, and labeling trans youth as mentally ill or disordered exacerbates these feelings of depression and anxiety and contributes to the otherization of these youth. Gender affirmation, social, legal, and medical barriers. Social affirmation refers to the presenting appearance of a person. Some trans youth face barriers to their social affirmation as they may not have access to gender affirming clothing or face abuse and degradation from their parents and or peers when they present as their preferred gender at home or in school or other social settings. Some trans youth also face legal barriers to legal affirmations in that registrars and statistics officials fail to recognize the preferred gender of the youth or adolescent. Um, this is also a barrier that trans adults face. Trans youth also face barriers to gender affirming healthcare, such as puberty suppressing medications, 
cross-sex hormone therapies, gender affirmation surgery, and access to mental health professionals. Access to mental health professionals has been particularly problematic due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Furthermore, in some countries, trans youth and adults face severe sanctions and even life-threatening penalties for being transgender. So I'd like to talk about some of the inter international instruments for human rights. So the Convention on the Rights of the Child is the first instrument I'll discuss. Uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is a convention of the United Nations. The CRC was adopted in 1990 and has been ratified by 196 countries, including Canada. Although the CRC is not legally binding, the principles contained in the convention inform domestic and international jurisprudence. Article two of the CRC states, states parties shall respect and ensure the rights set forth in the present convention to each child within their jurisdiction without discrimination of any kind, irrespective of the child's or their parents or legal guardians, race, color, lang sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national, ethnic or social origin, property, disability, birth or other status. Other status has been held to include gender identity and gender expression as well as sexual orientation. States parties shall take all appropriate measures to ensure that the child is protected, protected against all forms of discrimination or punishment on the basis of the status, activities, expressed opinions or beliefs of the child's parents, legal guardians, or family members. Article three states that in all actions concerning children, whether undertaken by public or private social welfare institutions, courts of law, administrative authorities or legislative bodies, the best interests of the child shall be a primary consideration. Article three is the basis for the best interest doctrine. I will discuss this doctrine further in the context of both an Australian and a Canadian case. Uh, article five says that states parties shall respect the responsibilities, rights and duties of parents or where applicable, the members of extended family or community as provided for by local custom, legal guardians, or other persons legally responsible for the child to provide in a manner consistent with the evolving capacities of the child, appropriate direction and guidance in the exercise by the child of the rights recognized in the present convention. Article 12 states, that states parties shall assure to the child who is capable of forming their own views, the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting the child. The views of the child being given due weight in accordance with the age and maturity of the child. For this purpose, the child shall in particular be provided the opportunity to be heard in any judicial and administrative proceedings affecting the child either directly or through a representative or an appropriate body in a manner consistent with the procedural rules of national law. Article 24 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child states that states parties recognize the right of the child to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health and to, facil and to facilities for the treatment of illness and rehabilitation of health. States parties shall strive to ensure that no child is deprived of his or her right of access to such healthcare services. Article 24.2 states that states parties shall pursue full implementation of this right and in particular shall take appropriate measures and for the purposes of this discussion to ensure the provision of necessary medical assistance and healthcare to all children with emphasis on the development of primary healthcare. Next, I'd like to speak on the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. The ICESER is an international covenant. The ICESER has been ratified by 171 countries, including Canada. This, although this is not a legally binding, this is not legally binding on states parties, its principles inform many policies, legislation, and jurisprudence on human rights issues. In Canada, only international laws have been incorporated 
only those international laws that have been incorporated or adopted into domestic law create legal rights for people in Canada. This will be discussed more in detail later. Article 1 of the ICESER states that all peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Article 2 of the ICESER, like the CRC, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, other status in this article has been held to include gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. Article two, article 2 states that states parties to the present covenant undertake to guarantee that the rights enunced, enunciated in the present covenant will be exercised without discrimination of any kind as to race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. Now that I've discussed the international human rights instruments, I'd like to discuss a case from Australia. So in the case of re-imagine from 2020, um, this case involved a 16 year old transgender person in Australia. Imogen was taking puberty suppressing hormones and wanted to start cross sex hormone therapy. Imogen's father supported this next step in Imogen's transition. However, Imogen's mother argued that Imogen did not have the capacity to consent to the medical treatments of puberty suppressants or cross sex hormone therapies. The issues facing the court were, among other things, Imogen's competence to consent to, to the transition treatments, including puberty suppressants and cross-sex hormones. And whether if Imogen was not competent, the court should make an order that is in Imogen's best interest authorizing the treatment. Additionally, there was a request to include an order that Imogen be granted parental responsibility to make her own decisions regarding her transition treatments. Though not expressly stated in this way, the court considered Imogen's right to self-determination and relied on the best interest doctrine to make their orders. However, although the court determined that Imogen was competent to consent to the treatments, the court granted the order to continue treatment not based on Imogen's capacity for consent, but based on the best interest doctrine. Um, I'd like to speak now about Canada. Um, so the Constitution Act of yeah. The Constitution Acts of 1867 and 1982, of which Schedule II of the 1982 Act forms the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, are the supreme law of Canada. Federal, provincial, and territorial laws make up the domestic law of this country. The ICESER and the CRC are important international documents. However, they are not domestic law, and the principles enshrined in those instruments are not legally enforceable in Canada. That is to say, a person in Canada cannot rely on the ICESER or the CRC alone to argue rights infringements. Canada has, however, adopted many principles of the ICESER and the CRC into various statutes, both federally and provincially. In Canada, there are several legal instruments that protect the rights of trans children. These include the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the Canadian Human Rights Act, and provincial and, ter and territorial human rights legislation. Bill C-16, an act to amend the Canadian Human Rights Act and the Canadian Criminal Code received royal, this bill received royal assent in 2017. And as a result, gender and gender expression were added to the Canadian Human Rights Code and the gender expression and gender expression and gender identity were included in section 3184 of the criminal code as identifiable groups for the purposes of hate crimes and in section 718.2 regarding sent sentencing principles. Provincial legislation also protects trans children from discrimination. The Alberta Human Rights Act expressly prohibits discrimination on the grounds of gender expression and gender identity. The act allows investigation into claims of discrimination in a variety of circumstances, such as statements, publications, notices, 
signs, symbols, emblems, or other representations that are published, issued, or displayed before the public. Discrimination is also prohibited in offering goods, services, accommodation, or facilities customarily available to the public. Discrimination is prohibited in tenancy, employment practices, employment applications or advertisements, and membership in trades unions, employers organizations, or occupational associate, associations. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the equality for every person in Canada. Section 15.1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms states that every individual is equal before and under the law and has the right to equal protection and equal benefit of the law without discrimination, and in particular without discrimination based on race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, or mental and physical disability. Although not expressly provided for, gender identity and gender expression, expression may be included in the charter as prohibited grounds for discrimination. The charter, however, only applies to government actors and does not apply to discrimination faced due to actions or behaviors of private citizens or private corporations. The Canadian Human Rights Act and the Alberta Human Rights Act are two of the legislative instruments that I'd like to discuss. So the CHRA is similar to the Charter in that it protects people in Canada from discrimination from, government, from the government. Unlike provincial and territorial human rights legislation, the CHRA applies only to employment and, ser and services provided by the federal government. The Alberta Human Rights Act protects against forms of discrimination in specified circumstances. Unlike the CHRA and the Charter, the Alberta Human Rights Act protects individuals from government actors and, the, and those in the private sector. <clears throat> Excuse me. The AHRA prohibits discrimination in the similar on the similar grounds as the Canadian Human Rights Act. So things such as statements, publications, notices um, that are published, issued, or displayed before the public, in goods, services, or accommodation or facilities customarily available to the public tenancy and employment practices. The, if you'd like to know more about the Alberta Human Rights Act, the ACLRC has a dedicated re resource page to learning more about the Alberta Human Rights Act um, on its website, and I encourage you to check this out if you would like to learn more. Uh, so I'd like to talk about the issue of consent. So in Canada, um, there's no universally recognized age of consent for medical treatments. One barrier faced by trans youth is, an is access to gender affirming healthcare. This can be healthcare in many forms, such as accessing appropriate mental health services, puberty suppressing medications, and for some, access to cross-sex hormones and gender affirmation surgery. As in, um, because in Canada, there's no federally mandated age of consent for medical procedures, um, some provinces and territories have addressed consent in explicit statutes. For example, in BC, the Infants Act, uh, Section 17 deals with consent to medical treatments. Subsection 1 provides definitions on healthcare and how and what healthcare provider stands to mean, and in subsection two and three, outline consent standards. Section 17.2 states that subject to subsection three, an infant may consent to healthcare, whether or not that healthcare would, in the absence of consent, constitute a trespass to the infant's person, and if an infant provides that consent, the consent is effective, and it is not necessary to obtain the consent, a consent to the healthcare from the infant's parents or guardian. Subsection three states that a request for or for consent, agreement or acquiescence to healthcare by an infant does not constitute consent to the healthcare for the purposes of subsection two, unless the healthcare providing, providing the healthcare has explained to the infant and has been satisfied that the infant understands the nature and consequences and the reasonably foreseeable benefits and risks of the healthcare and has made reasonable efforts to determine and has concluded that the healthcare is in the infant's best interests. This follows the general principles of informed consent. And there are four main principles of informed consent. 
First is that the decision maker has the capacity to make the decision. Second is that the decision maker is adequately informed. That is given all of the relevant information that a reasonable person would require to make this uh, decision. And that the re resultant decision must be voluntary and free of coercion. Unlike BC, Alberta, in Alberta, there is no explicit age of consent. The College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta have issued guidelines in the form of advice to the professions, which outline, among other things, a minor's capacity to consent to medical treatment. The CPSA has stated that in Alberta, a mature minor who is not a ward of a director under the Child, Youth and Family Enhancement Act is entitled to give or refuse consent for a proposed treatment and that a guardian has no authority to override or veto the mature minor's decision. This is also known as the mature minor doctrine. Alberta has established no set age for a mature minor. The more serious the proposed treatment, the greater the level of maturity required before a child can be considered a mature minor. The courts generally recognize approximately 16 years as the threshold for maturity, and none have recognized any individual younger than 14 years of age. Child welfare authorities in Alberta consider 12 years of age sufficient for a child to be consulted on decisions that affect the child, although the child's opinion is not determinative of what does occur. These consultations are typically related to the disclosure of information or decisions about the custody of the child, though are not always determinative. So I'd like to bring up a case from the British Columbia Court of Appeal in A, B, and C, D. This case involved an appeal by a 14-year-old transgender person and concerned the hormone treatment that they were receiving, namely the puberty suppressants. Among the issues concerned um, was an, uh, among issues concerning a number of interveners, one of the court's main considerations was the capacity for the youth to consent to puberty suppressing treatment. And as a reminder, uh, BC has the Infant Act, which outlines what when consent will be found. So background to this case is that in February 2019, the Defendant AB sought a declaration from the court to be found competent to consent to receiving puberty suppressing hormones. AB's father, CD, sought injunctive relief to prevent the administration of puberty suppressing hormones. The court determined that it was in the best, the child's best interest to continue hormone treatment. The court also determined that AB had capacity to consent to the treatment in line with section 17 of the Infants Act. The court also granted an order that um, attempting to persuade, oh, in the, this was in the first instance. So attempting to persuade AB to abandon treatment for gender dysphoria, addressing AB by his birth name and referring to AB as a girl or with female pronouns, whether to him directly or to third parties shall be considered to be family violence under section 38 of the Family Act Law Act in BC. Subsequent to this case, AB applied for an order restricting CB, CD from communicating with media and others regarding the specifics of AB, such as gender, pronouns, treatment, etc., for fear that AB would be outed in the community and would face bullying and harassment, torment, and discrimination. The, this order was granted. In the BC or the the BC Court of Appeal granted leave to a number of interveners in this case, such as the Canadian Professional Association for Transgender Health and the Provincial Health Services Authority. These interveners provided the court with specified information regarding the consent standard outlined in Section 17 of the Infants Act and the use of hormone therapies, both puberty suppressing and cross-sex. The Court of Appeal held that the Infants Act applied and it was determined that AB had the capacity to consent to the treatment. However, the Court of Appeal overturned the lower court's ruling that misgendering AB or persuading him to abandon treatment for gender dysphoria did not constitute family violence. However, they did uphold the communication ban. This case involves the best interest of the child doctrine and in recognizing capacity gives effect to a child's right to self-determination. 
Thank you. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, we only have a few minutes for questions because uh, we have to end this meeting because I have another meeting at 2.30 with my board, with the board. Um, <clears throat> before we uh, take, I would say we'll probably have to end at 2.20. Um, I wanted to say, even though it seemed like when we read all these different, or heard all these different presentations, I was <clears throat> kind of thinking, uh, there are interconnected factors in all of these uh, presentations, which is fascinating. For example, um, we of course talked about the environment, but when we talked about child marriage, we talked about the sustainable development goals. And that is also <laughs> um, part of the environment and, and so on. And so, uh, and then we when we moved on to the trans children's, uh, rights. Um, <clears throat> we talked a lot about the various human rights instruments and international human rights instruments that address the issue. So what, what I came away from this presentation feeling, these all these presentations, is feeling how interconnected both rights and responsibilities are and how important it is for people to be able to participate uh, in the determination of their rights. And I thank you all for your wonderful um, contributions. And I have a lot to think about. Um, now, if you want to ask a question, you can either use the chat or just ask. Um, I can't tell if there's anybody in the chat. Just a minute here. It's not letting me. Are you still sharing your screen? No, oh, I don't know. My computer is being weird. Okay, um, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> so, how will getting or recognizing a human right to the clean environment help us uh, advocate for climate change? I, I, anyone can answer that who who dealt with that issue. Sure. Um, I can jump in on that just quickly. Um, again, because the the right right now is just contained in a resolution, uh, a lot of its power really mainly comes from sort of the political sway and impact that that resolution holds. Um, a lot of international law, uh, at least from from what I saw in in my studies, a lot of it sort of comes from uh, political pressure. Once you sort of are uh, seen as a nation who is has a good reputation as upholding human rights, once international human rights sort of go start to go in a direction, uh, such as with supporting the right to uh, a clean and healthy environment, um, in order sort of to sort of keep up that reputation as being a, a good human rights um, state, uh, a lot of nations will start of start to follow that. Um, and I think another way that this right will be really helpful, um, uh, right now there's a really big um, resurgence of uh, children uh, activists uh, and particularly children leading climate litigation uh, against countries, um, primarily due to the fact that specific nations and states are failing to uh, uphold certain human rights that uh, are either contained in international human rights treaties or regional human rights treaties. Um, so I think, again, although this is a, a non-binding resolution, I think having that extra international recognition that um, A, the, the environment, uh, the right to a clean environment has been regarded as a human right and that a clean environment is related to all of these other human rights that are can, contained in uh, more persuasive and more binding instruments such as treaties. I think that will really help lend some additional um, power and sway to, to some of these cases that children are leading against countries. It's interesting how there's this, um, a, a string, also another commonality between all of this is the importance of respecting children and children's issues and their our future and 
how they are impacted so significantly by a lot of our laws and policies and and uh, we, we and it's not just over there somewhere else it's in Canada it's everywhere so mm -hmm. um one quote that that always stands out to me is climate change doesn't respect state boundaries so oh. even if even if your if your state or your country is doing a great job um it has to be a global effort oh. um pollution just doesn't stay within the the confines of your your state boundaries so it has to really be a global effort that we see going across the world and related to that i think we've all lived through this COVID 19 thing um <clears throat> this awful COVID 19 thing um does it have any connection to the right to a clean environment um yeah, I mean, it, it came up in the uh, video from the special rapporteur uh, where he mentioned that um, as we see more environmental deterioration, as um, human societies are encroaching further and further into the environment, we're coming into closer contact with animals. So we are seeing more, um, I think the wording is zo zoogenic yes. um, yeah. diseases. So things like COVID-19. So um, a lot of research does indicate that we're probably more likely than, than not to start to encounter more of these types of um, diseases if we don't start to rein back on, on that trend. Yeah, it's, it's frightening, actually. It feels mm -hmm. overwhelming. Are there any other one last minute questions? If you have burning questions and we haven't had a chance to address them, please email us. And I'm sure one of us will be pleased to uh, find an answer for you. Uh, did I, anyone else? I, you know, I, I'm sorry, I can't see the chat. <clears throat> it's blocked off on my computer for some reason. Hi, I actually had a question um, kind of similar to what was just addressed, specific to indigenous, indigenous communities who haven't received um, proper access to water or proper access to clean water. Uh, I was just wondering if you had any insight about how that would change going forward or what the federal government has been doing, because um, it seems like a problem that's been overlooked. Thank you. Anybody want to handle that one? <laughs> I can take it or yeah. you go okay. ahead. No. <laughs> Okay, well, what I would like to speak to that, uh, you know, is this has been going on for a long time because I still remember uh, the one we had in the Ontario. And um, I believe the problem is still political, although we are, everyone is guaranteed the rights uh, to, <coughs> to LT and good standard of uh, living within the constitution and uh, ancillary law, but nothing has been done. But well, we hope that uh, we, I know that the the government uh, currently is trying to do the best because it's uh, been like a black eye for them, when, especially with respect to reconciliation uh, with uh, the indigenous rights and others. So um, in time, and especially now, uh, the, the the government and the people should be able to uh, force the hands of the government to make sure that you know everyone in Canada, particularly the indigenous people, have the right to the clean water in the, in compliance with what the Canada has uh, agreed to do within the international. <clears throat> Uh, human rights act and the treaty great thank you if i could just jump just super yeah, quick please jump in um, real quick <laughs> yeah yeah um and yeah just adding on to uh what was said um canada recently adopted i think it's called bill c15 which yeah. Um, adopts uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples into um, domestic Canadian law. So um, I think that hopefully will be an, an additional push for, for Canada to um, 
not only respect its own uh, duties to reconciliation, but to also really step up and uh, move forward with their international, internationally recognized duties under uh, UNDRIP to uh, obviously respect the right to clean water, which is again, an international human right. So um, I think we are starting to see a trend of international um, rights and obligations trickling their way more so into Canada. So. I think, again, it, it remains to be seen how that comes about, but I think we are on a positive trajectory with that. Yeah, and BC has also implemented the UNDRIP as well. So fingers crossed. Thank you all. I'm sorry I have to leave now, but I have another meeting in, in a few minutes and I need to thank you all so much for all your hard work and for organizing today's event. And uh, again, if you have other questions, please uh, email anybody on the panel or just email the Research Central Center and we'll direct the question accordingly. All right, well, have a great International Human Rights Day on December 10th. Thank you for your attention and we'll see you again soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you.